Mark. Hey, Joe. How are you doing? I'm doing just peachy. Thank you very much. This is our third episode. And actually, this is a very exciting one because this is the first episode in which we actually have a real live guest. Yes, I am very excited about this. And I'm really excited about this guest. I invited him to be the first guest because not only does he have all of the qualities that we're looking for in a guest, which is that he can he can talk, not only talk, but talk well, much better than me, as I've discovered editing the first two episodes, I can't actually really talk. I can, <laughs> all of this now is, is just because I'm like extremely finely edited. But anyway, this guest, he can actually talk and he's literate and, and intelligent and he's bringing a piece of uh, art or creation to this podcast to talk about. And his name is Douglas Smith. I don't actually know. I've known him for a little while, but I don't know if he prefers Doug or Douglas. Doug. I, I write I write under Douglas, yeah, but just, you know, between friends, it's Doug. Well, and, and we, are, uh, we are all friends here. Well, thank you very much for joining our podcast. Hey, thanks for having me, guys. This is great. And Douglas, you are a creative person. That's part of what we're trying, we're going for here, right? Is talking to creative people. And Douglas is a very creative person. <laughs> yeah. Uh, like you guys. Yeah. I'm a spec fic writer. I've been writing since, I'm going to say 1995. And hold that date in your mind because it actually ties back in a very roundabout way to what we're going to be talking about today. I write uh, speculative fiction, a bit of mainstream now and then. I've won some awards. I started out writing mostly short fiction for years and years. I just finished my fourth novel, which is the, uh, the third book in a uh, trilogy. And the first book in that trilogy will be coming out later this year. Well, and congratulations on uh, the completion of your recent novel. Almost killed me. <laughs> and, and a trilogy, too. That's, that's awesome. Oh, yeah. No, the trilogy. Uh, yeah. It's like I'd written one novel and I said, yeah, let's, let's try a trilogy. How hard can that be? <laughs> uh, it's not easy. <laughs> no, that's amazing. You're actually one of the most acclaimed short fiction writers in Canada, if not uh, many other countries. Yeah. How many times have you won the Aurora Award for short fiction? I, I've won it three times, but I also, I think I have the record for losing it the most times. So, <laughs> <laughs> But that, that means you're consistently good, that you're on the list, right? Yeah, I've, I've lost it 16 times if I'm right. Something <laughs> like that. Goodness. Well, that that's the human negative bias coming up right there, because if I was you i would focus on the wins yeah i don't mention that last bit in my bio oddly so yeah and didn't you get the campbell award too at some point i was on the short list oh okay for, yeah best yeah. new writer even that yeah that was fun that's really cool that was a canadian streak back then i think uh nello hopkinson had won it mm -hmm. and then the next year Corey doctoral won it and then i lost it so you know <laughs> it was three, three. So you couldn't bring the three Pete in. <laughs> I know. I could not. I could not. Anything else that you want to tell us about yourself before we get into what you want to talk about? Um, geez. Well, it's going to relate to what we're talking about today. So, like back when I had a day job, I'm, I'm retired now. I worked in um, Deloitte. I was in international IT, the global IT group, and I, I was doing a lot of traveling, which was quite cool. And one of the things I always did when I was in a, another city, well, actually two things. I tried to do a cycling tour because I'm a cyclist and I would generally visit the, um, the local art museum or museums. And all this ties into the, what I want to share today because it relates to a trip to Berlin in 2007 and a very particular painting that I saw there. Can you unveil the painting for us? Metaphorically? Metaphorically. It should be in your inbox, guys, but I sent you all a right. link. And I'll shoot you to a Wikipedia page. So the painting is by Arnold Bachlin, who was a, a Swiss symbolist artist. And the painting itself is called I Love the Dead. Uh -huh. And I didn't know until I actually started doing research on it. I didn't think there were multiple versions. But Bachlin actually did five versions of this painting from 1880 through, I think, 86. The one that I saw in Berlin was his third one. So who cares? Why, why am I talking about this? Well, my favorite, all-time favorite speculative fiction author is the late American writer Roger Zelazny. Oh, yeah. And Zelazny, one of his early novels way back in the 60s, I think it was 69, which is kind of scary because that's like over half a century ago. So it makes me feel really old. But he wrote... Third, maybe second novel, I don't know, it was called Isle of the Dead. Mm -hmm. 
And I remember reading that and that he'd mentioned um, a painting and it is this painting. Ah. I thought, well, that was cool. So anyway, I'm in Berlin. I'm visiting art museums as I tend to do. And I'm walking through this one gallery, the old National Gallery, I think it's called. Huge museum. And I come up to this one painting, which looks really cool. I say, oh, I like this. It's kind of got a, I don't know, surreal fantasy feel to it. And I'm looking at the name of it, and it's Isle of the Dead. And I'm going, no, it couldn't be. And it was. So it was just this little buzz that I, here I am in Berlin, and I'm finding a, a painting that inspired a novel by one of my favorite all-time writers. So, yeah, that's the connection to speculative fiction. But this painting itself, it invokes a feeling of sort of surreal fantasy world. There's sort of a, a I don't know, a morose atmosphere to it. It seems like a, it's a rock island. It kind of formed like a theater, actually, with, with trees where you would think the stage would be. Yeah. And there's arches. So it kind of, there's a Roman kind of Greco feel to it. And, and then there's a boat approaching the island. And if I zoom in, it seems like a, like a small boat, like a dinghy or, and somebody's on it. Two, two figures are on it. I see two figures. Yeah. Plus a coffin or something that's maybe a coffin. Yeah. Mark, you're right. It's certainly interpreted as being a coffin given the title of the painting. But it's got a sort of celebratory feel to it because there's sort of decorative wreaths hung off the coffin. And the, the figure that's standing right in front of the coffin almost looks like a ghost, right? Because it's, it's wearing a white cloak. All you can yeah. see is it from the back. You, you can't see faces. All you see is the backs of the figures. And the archways, Joe, you mentioned them. They're older than Roman though, right? Because they're yeah. square block archways. They're not curved like Roman yeah. archways. And, they, and it looks like they're carved into the living rock. Yes. Yeah. They remind me of like Incan. Uh, yeah, because you're, they're slightly wider at the bottom. Yep. If you know Incan uh, doorways. I was thinking Stonehenge when you first showed us to us. Yeah, yeah same, same kind of shape. shape. Yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 Which would make it like 6,000 years old. If you look at the earlier version, so I look at this, uh, the boat, what struck me was I'm not quite sure how it's being propelled. Like it's obviously moving because you see a bit of a wake. If you look at the earlier versions, the figure in the back is is quite clearly an oarsman. They, they've got two oh. uh, two oars out to oh, the side. Oh, yeah. I can see absolutely nothing here. A rower. Um, yeah. Oh, and the first, the first one, what's interesting about the first one, this is the Basil version, I think. They're, they're going the other direction, right? Because the way she's sitting is that the boat would be leaving the island, not going to the island. The oarsman, you're right. I've never noticed that, Mark. Like, assuming the, the oarsman's got their back to the paintings, that means when they do a pull, they're pulling away from the island. Yeah. That's cool. And that would be the same in the, in the final version, which is the bow is facing away from the island. So the implication would be it's leaving the island. Interesting. Whereas this one, obviously, with the wake, it's going through the island. Do you want to hear what Zelazny wrote about it? Yeah, I do. I love Zelazny, by the way. Yeah, I think we're all huge Zelazny fans here. I just actually finished reading Lord of Light. Uh, oh, yeah, best. it's a great Still book. Still his best, brilliant, brilliant. So actually, before I do that, I should probably, like Isle of the Dead, it's about this character, Francis Sandow. He's born in the 20th century, but this takes place... 200, 300 years in the future. And he, he went on one of these generations ships where he was cryo frozen. And then when he's awoken, finally technology has improved so much that actually have fast on the light drives. He's invested his money. Short story. He's very rich, but he ends up, I can't remember if he crashes or whatever, but he ends up on this uh, planet of the Payans, who are an incredibly ancient civilization. And they have this process where they can symbiotically merge with one of their pantheon of gods. And he just happens to be found by one of the masters of this process who teaches it to him. He's the first non Payan ever to learn how to do this. The result is he can actually merge with a Payan god, Shimbo of Dark Tree. And that gives him this power to terraform worlds. And that's how he makes his millions. 
So he's basically the oldest human in the galaxy now because of his long uh, travel through suspended animation, etc. And he's incredibly rich. So you got this very jaded person, oldest human with incredible power and incredible resources. And on one of the planets, he terraformed and he does it for clients like, hey, design me a planet. <laughs> he decided on a whim to create his version of the Isle of the Dead. Hmm. And it obviously, as you can probably suspect, is figures in the climax of the book. But this is what Zelazny writes uh, Francis Sandoz's thoughts when he's returning to the Isle of the Dead after many, many years for this big climactic confrontation. The sense of the serene passing, this was absent. This place was the butcher's block at the end of the run. I hated it and I feared it. I knew that I lacked the spiritual stamina to ever duplicate it. It was one of those once-in-a-lifetime creations that made me wish I hadn't. To cross over the dark waters meant to me a confrontation with something within myself that I did not understand or accept. Suddenly this was the answer, looming, the heaped remains of everything that goes down and does not come again to shore. Life's giant kitchen midden, the rubbish heap that remains after all things pass, the place that stands in testament to the futility of all ideals and intentions, good or bad the rock that smashes values there, signalizing the ultimate uselessness of life itself, which must one day be broken upon it, not to rise, never, no, not ever again. So he had pretty, uh, pretty negative <laughs> feelings about what he created. But, um, you know, I, I read that passage and I look at this painting and I actually don't get the same reaction. Yeah, I was, I was going to say what, about this painting kind of drives you? What inspires you about it? Well, I think, um, you know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a fantasy writer, probably, you know, as much or more than science fiction. And, and this just has such a beautiful, surreal, fantastic quality to it. And the air of mystery, too. You know, what we talked about is, you know, is it a coffin? Who's in the coffin? Who's, who's, who's writing with the coffin? What is the story of those people, you know? And what is this place? It's foreboding, but there's a beautiful foreboding to this picture. And I, I like this version better than the other two, uh, the earlier two. This has um, some lightness to it. Yeah, there's there's the there's the part sort of out the, the bottom right where there's like obviously some sunlight hitting the island, and there's flowers, wildflowers growing up the walls and around a plinth. And it's yeah, it's got a real. Uh, light to dark contrast going in that part of the painting, which is cool. It almost seems hopeful in some ways. Yeah, which I, you know, I um, when I read the passage, I'm thinking, wow, <laughs> maybe you saw the darker version because this one, this one didn't call that to me. So that was that was the impetus of picking this one. Now the white figure is that a statue or is that a person standing in the boat? It's generally interpreted as a person who is is standing in front of a coffin and they're they're shrouded in in white, which in many cultures is the color of the of mourning of the dead, not black. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, in Eastern cultures, it's white, not 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 black. Because I have to say, it's not the most cheery painting. No. <laughs> yeah, no. <laughs> and then you read uh, what you read about um, what Zelazny had to say about it, and that is not cheery. <laughs> so, but it's interesting that you have a different, more positive interpretation of the whole thing. Yeah. So uh, when I, when I came across the painting, I'm going, "Oh my God, that's got to be it!" And uh, I checked, and sure enough, this is uh, he was he specifically references Bachlin's Isle of the Dead. But I didn't realize that there were different versions. And yet, to me, this one does not, would not call up the passage I read out. Hmm. I noticed on the Wikipedia page, it said that this was at one point one of the most popular paintings in Germany, that there was a version of it hanging in every kitchen wall. Yes. What the? Why would you have it? Yeah, <laughs> I mean, okay, yeah, exactly. I admire the painting <laughs> and I'm glad that you, that you brought it to us. Would I hang it in my kitchen wall? No. <laughs> No. <laughs> What's that, Daddy? Oh, that's Isle of the Dead. <laughs> that's what happens when you die, darling. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, yeah. and I got to say, like, if it came down to, you know, that famous painting of the dogs playing poker and this and this painting. <laughs> go for the dogs. Um, again, I admire this painting, but I'd probably go for the dogs playing poker to put it in my kitchen. Yeah. <laughs> Why not both? 
I mean, come on. Oh, okay. Now you're just complicating things. Cause <laughs> why, why do you have to choose? <laughs> That's right. I think then I'd have to go to my wife, who would probably not uh, hang either opinion. <laughs> but. So this is a really, this is a cool surprise yeah, for me. Cool. Well, I figured I should bring a speculative element. You know, Zelazny died far too young. I mentioned I started writing in 1995. And quite frankly, his his early death from cancer was one of the reasons I finally said, okay, screw it. I'm not going to wait any longer. I'm going to, I'm going to start writing and, and you know, chase the writing dream. So I actually started writing about a month after I read of his passing that summer, summer of uh, 95. So it kind of ties into my life, Zelazny, that way as well. I didn't even actually know about this painting. So again, thanks for bringing it to us. I would say, like, I think I've seen other people say this. I don't think I'm the person saying this, but your writing does have some of the beautiful poetic quality that, that Zelazny's writing has. So that doesn't surprise me at all that his death inspired you to start writing seriously. Yeah, definitely. I think a lot of my early stories, Mark, were, you know, trying to do odes to Zelazny or, or something like that. Mm-hmm. There's only one story I ever wrote, and that was um, that? The Boys Are Back in Town, where I very specifically said, I'm going to write something that Zelazny might have written. You know, a lot of his his books, his stories were drawn from mythology, um, like Creatures of Light and Darkness from the Egyptian Gods, mm-hmm. um, Eye of Cat from um, uh, Navajo religion. One we mentioned earlier, Lord of Light, of course, you know, he just does this fantastic play with the Hindu pantheon of gods. And what I liked about him was he, I think he's, I don't know if he coined the term, but I always thought of him as science fantasy. Like he could write science fiction like it was fantastic, like it was a fantasy. And and his magic systems and his fantasies were like almost scientifically sound. He deliberately did that in, in Lord of Light. Yeah. It was definitely science fiction, but deliberately written as fantasy. Yeah, he used, he basically gave all of the characters, not to spoil it for anyone, but, um, you know, he uses uh, the panth- Hindu pantheon of gods, where the uh, original settlers of this planet use you know, scientific technology to set them up with godlike powers. So they, they present themselves as godlike beings and their avatars. But basically, it, it's science fiction at its root. It's mm-hmm. a fantastic, fantastic book if no one's read it. Yeah. And the the most famous pun oh, in God. science fiction in that book. <laughs> the um, <laughs> When the uh, fit hit the shan. When the fit hit the shan, <laughs> oh, yeah. which I didn't notice my first time reading the book and then read about it later about this famous science fiction pun. I'm like, what? I read that book. I didn't notice that. I had to go back and and, and there it is. <laughs> so I asked me if, if he had a weak point, it was he all he loved puns. Yeah. And he would he would work puns into his uh, into his work so often. <laughs> yeah, it was brilliant. Sometimes was to the detriment of the work. <laughs> <laughs> now, can I ask you because you're such a big Zelazny fan, what do you think his his legacy is, his impact is on the field? It's hard looking back. I mean, I, I still think he was one of the most brilliant writers, certainly American science fiction fantasy writers. I think Lord of Light was his best book. But if you mention Zelazny to a lot of readers who haven't read all of his stuff like I have, they'd probably talk about the Amber series. His most accessible. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's a great series. Yeah, that's the one that I would probably mention first. Yeah. It's such a great series. I mean, even that series is like he was, I think maybe Michael Moorcock was talking about the multiverse before uh, Zelazny was, but that was actually in some ways the best sort of version of the multiverse that I ever saw when I was growing up. Yeah, it was so imaginative. I mean, it was so fresh. Yeah. Uh, You read the first book and you, you basically are along for the ride with Corwin, who's thinking, what the hell is going on? (laughs) He does that so well. Well, and if I remember correctly, he would end the books on these crazy kind of cliffhangers. Yeah. I remember my my roommate at the time, uh, Paul White, who introduced me to to Roger Zelazny and the Amber series. He, I was sitting beside him on a couch. I was reading something. He was reading that. He closed the book and he cursed loudly. <laughs> and I'm like, well, what, what's the problem? And he's like, this bastard. This, he just ended the book on a complete... Now I... I got to wait for the next one to come out. And he was very angry. And that, that response 
got me so interested in Zelazny that I started reading the Amber series and became an enormous fan. I wonder if that was prompted by his publisher because there was a time period in the 80s when they kept re-releasing Zelazny's books. And I was such an idiot that I was like, it was a different cover, but the same title, but I just <laughs> couldn't remember the titles. I probably bought some of the same book three or four times. Uh, it's like, oh, it's a new one. It's a new one. It's a new one. No, nope, same one. <laughs> <laughs> so I missed the pun too. Don't feel bad, Joe. <laughs> <laughs> the, the result of the, the delayed releases though back then, like every time a new Amber book came out, I would put it aside. Then I'd go back and reread the earlier books. So, you know, I've, I've reread the first one, you know. 20 times, the second one, 19 times. <laughs> so make sure you're all up to date. Pre-Netflix binging. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, the, you know, the late binging. But Zelazny, yeah, to your point, he died in his late 50s, didn't he? He was 56 or 57. I was from cancer, you know, because of the U.S. and their weird total lack of healthcare system back then. He was pretty well broke. So he did some writing some books jointly, where I'm sure the other author did most of it. But they had his name on the cover. So, you know, he was doing a lot of things late in life to raise money from his writing to you know, pay for, for medical bills, which, you know, is sad. Such an, an amazing, amazing writer that he was. That's horrible. Well, and that's the fate of, of many writers. Uh, like even today, it's such a challenge to make any kind of a living writing. Yeah. But a writer of Zelazny's stature to not be able to make a go of it, it is damning. Oh, it, it really is. It just shows how much we don't, you know, the interest in your podcast is about works of art <laughs> and, you know, the, the underlying message in so many cases is, yeah, but they died penniless, which is so sad. So, you know, what, what does humanity really think about art? Uh, it's just so contradictory because, I mean, art is kind of like life, right? Like that's one of the things that makes life worth living, love and relationships and family. And, and I would say art is another one of those pillars that we rely on. Yeah, but so many artists are not appreciated in their own time. That's sad. And I think it is a part of, you know, the underlying inspiration for this podcast is because we're always looking for whatever we can do to to amplify the message, get the signal out there. And it's so hard unless you have some multinational corporation behind you. How do you actually do that? So we're all scrambling to figure how can we promote our wares? And I'm in, really interested in not just promoting my own wares, of which there actually isn't that many, but promoting the wares of, of others like you guys and like other people that we will talk about on this podcast. And that is why I am trying to suck Mark into doing this podcast for the next 30 years so that we can <laughs> amplify I, the signal of as many people as possible. If you can promise me 30 years, I'm happy with that. <laughs> Great. Douglas, I thought for sure you were going to bring another painting when when you when you mentioned you thought you were thinking about a painting. Do you know which one I thought you were going to bring? Oh, I do, I do, I do. I bet it's by Van Gogh. I I was positive. Yeah, too. Like I was so positive. That's a great segue here, Mark. I've written a lot of stories that are inspired by something artistic created by another person. So I ha I have a story called bouquet of flowers in a vase by van gogh yep exactly the bouquet of flowers in a in a vase yeah because that's such a beautiful story it's a time travel love story but i've also i just finished actually it's coming out in the next issue of on spec published i will have published three stories inspired by springsteen songs because i love springsteen and I've got a couple of other stories that are inspired by one symphony. It's inspired by sort of music and sculpture. And By Her Hand, She Draws You Down is a horror short story. Not inspired by a particular piece of art or an artist, but it's about an artist. So I, I don't know. I've always been fascinated by work, by movies, by books about artists that focus on a creative person. And yeah, I, I, I don't know why, but I really enjoy them. So yeah, you know, at one point I was thinking, yeah, I'll bring that one, but it's not one of my favorite Van Goghs actually. And I don't know what I'd say beyond talking about my story, which sounds. It's, I love that story. It's beautifully written. Um, and it's interesting. We share, we share, so a love of Springsteen, we share that for sure. And I'm dying to know what three songs you're going to use, but, and then I'm also the same. I mean, my first novel, one of the main characters is Mozart. Now he's immortal and he's it's set in the future, but he's still basically Mozart. He's not. So I had to do a lot of research on that 
guy to understand him well enough to write my version. And I think there is just something so fascinating about looking at a life that's lived through art, which some of these characters are. It just teaches you so much about how we create. Now, Doug, do you paint? I do not paint. No, absolutely no uh, artistic abilities at all. Well, except for writing. Yeah. Well, thank God I can write. I, I, I was going to mention one more thing because that Berlin trip uh, where I found this Isle of the Dead painting, it was sort of a, a visual trip for me too, because um, my dad had been stationed in World War II in Holland, thankfully near the end of the war. And then after the Allies won, he and some buddies took a trip to Berlin. And I came across some photos he'd taken from that trip. And one of it was of the, the Reichstag bombed out. Another one was of Brandenburg Tor, Brandenburg Gate, which is probably the most famous of the, the gates. It was actually one of the checkpoints between East and West Berlin. And then the other one was this bombed out what I thought was a church. I didn't really know what it was. So I thought it would be cool if I went back or I went around Berlin and I took the same pictures. This mm. was in 2007. So, you know, over 60 years later of those. And so I did. And if you guys are interested, I'm going to send you those three pictures as well. So I, I uh, you know, tried to stand at the same spot to get the Reichstag and Brandenburg Tor, etc. The church was a challenge. I finally found it by showing it to a local. And they said, oh, yes, very famous church. Oh, okay. And it's famous because they did not restore it. They did not tear it down. They did not restore it. They kept it in essentially its its partially destructed form as a reminder of the war, sort of oh. as a as a, a reminder to future generations of you know this is what it, what war really looks like. Taking that shot from the same angle required me standing in the middle of like a four lane <laughs> street. <laughs> so I can run out, take a picture. No, that didn't work out. Run back out, take a picture, come back. Oh my so, good. But I got, I got all three. I finally got all three. But sadly, uh, my this was a year after my dad had passed. So for me, it was sort of a, I don't know, I guess a, my own memorial to him and, and sort of a cathartic experience for me as well. To stand where he had stood, you know. 60 years ago. Yeah. That's a beautiful story. Do you have a sense to connect with them? Anything else you'd like to tell us about that painting or uh, Zelazny? Any final thoughts on that? Just to your listeners, if you if you have never read Roger Zelazny, go do. His best novels, I think we've mentioned, The Lord of Light and The Amber Series are probably the most popular, but I love all of his work. His short fiction is brilliant. Bradbury is probably the only person I'd put up against him in terms of a speculative short fiction writer. I don't know how many times he, he won six Hugos and, and three Nebulos, I think. And a lot of those awards were for, uh, for short fiction. Oh, just his prose. Oh, his, he was a poet. Yeah. He spent, apparently he wrote, he wrote poetry every day. And, and he said, I think it shows because his prose is very poetic despite the bad puns. Yeah. I did not know that. Yes, his prose is, is blazing in its pyrotechnical potency. Say that five times fast. That was pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Got alliteration and everything. Yeah, that, that was good, dude. <laughs> so if, if, peop, if the listeners want to start with Zelazny, um, you know, Lord of Light for a novel, or try Last Defender of Camelot for his collections. Oh, that's great, because it's hard to find short stories sometimes. Probably my favorite collection yeah. of his. Yeah. We've well, got lots of collections, out, but I'd, I'd start with that one. One more Zelazny um, story that won, I think, his last award. It was called 24 Views of Mount Fuji by Hokusai. And it's an entire story <laughs> based on 24 paintings by the, the Japanese artist Hokusai. And it's, uh, it's a great story. It was well-deserving of winning an award. So he did it, too. He did it more than once inspired by art yeah i think we got something here like i think this is a real theme in in the like i've heard people say that there's no new stories right there's like only a few stories and we just tell them over and over again and the idea that we're it's not plagiarism when you're inspired by something it's you're taking something as a starting point and then creating something new based on it i think that's kind of the theme that runs through history well we all stand in the shoulders of giants yeah exactly yeah 
Exactly. We yeah, it's, it's the highest compliment you can pay to a work of art is that, wow, this inspired me to, to create something else. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. And I think those people who, who say that there's only seven types of stories have only read seven stories. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's the journey of reading and experiencing a story. You know, essentially the, the actual story, the plot is, is not why you enjoy the story. So what is coming up next for you, Doug? Well, I'm releasing the trilogy. I've got the on-spec story coming out, uh, the next issue. I've got my first literary or mainstream story being published in another great Canadian magazine, Pulp Literature. Oh, so great. it'll be out in its next issue, but I don't really know the timing of that. And can you tell us what the three Springsteens are? I can't not know now. <laughs> okay, well... Um, it will haunt me. This one that's coming out now is is uh, Gypsy Bikers Coming Home, uh, okay. which is from the Magic album, uh, yep. Gypsy Bikers song. Yep. Radio Nowhere. From, I love that song. Uh, yeah, it's great. So it, it was in an anthology. Um, geez, who else was in? A lot of Canadian writers. Uh, Julie Trinada. And it was edited by uh, Mark Lefebvre. Mm, great. It's called Campus Chills. Ah. And the theme of that anthology was it had to take place on a Canadian university campus. How did I not write a story for that? That sounds like I, don't know. I, know <laughs> I worked on a campus. That. I totally missed it. Well, you, well I'm yeah. not... No, I, I, I'm not that good at writing short stories, I'll be honest. It's, I find it very challenging. Yeah, so I, I, the best part of that story was I got uh, the research. I went back. I went to University of Waterloo, so I obviously based it there. And I went back to the campus. And the cool thing about being a writer is people will be so helpful <laughs> in you doing your research. So I actually got a tour of the uh, famous or infamous steam tunnels that run all under the campus. A lot of the story takes place there, but it was, it was quite cool saying, hey, can you let me into the steam tunnels? And also the radio station, the campus radio station, too. So it was. Uh, it was yeah. Fun. And the third one? What was the third one? What did I have? I've got radio nowhere. <laughs> Sorry, Mark's OCD kicks in. Oh, my own. My God. Well, just while he's looking for that, yeah. I'll just say that it is true that uh, people are so helpful with, uh, you know, with our writing, supporting our writing. Away. If only they would pay us. <laughs> So now I'm trying to figure out, uh, oh, yeah, going down to Lucky Town, which is from the full lyric oh, from Lucky right. Town. So I got an idea for Born to Run. I got an idea for Thunder Road. Um, this is definitely going to be a collection we'll be able to buy at some point. It would be nice and get him to write an intro. You know, well, there you go. There's a dream. <laughs> there's a dream. Yeah, well, we'll mention you when we have him on the podcast. Yeah. Okay, good. Yeah. <laughs> Please stay. Thank you, Doug. It's been great chatting with you and catching up a little bit. Yeah, my God. I Love the art you brought. Okay, thanks. Yes, thank great you. pick. Yes, I'll be sure to hang it on my kitchen wall as soon as I can find a copy. <laughs> can I have your dogs playing poker then if you're going to replace it? <laughs> no. <laughs> I'll find another place for it. Nice try. All right. Thank you, guys, both. Okay, listen. Thanks, guys, so much for having me on. It's been fun. been listening to recreative a podcast about creativity talking to creative people from every walk of life about the art that inspires them and you're probably wondering how can i support this podcast i am wondering joe how can i support this podcast i mean apart from being on it there's no advertisements in this podcast there's no tip jars there's nothing about like buying us a coffee or anything like that but there is a way that you can support us. And what is that? It's not about supporting us. It's about supporting the people that we're talking to. I think most of the people we've talked to are artists of some description, and they probably have some kind of artistic product that you could buy. And if you enjoyed it, maybe you could review it for them. Oh, yeah. But maybe us too. Yeah, you know what? Us too. It wouldn't hurt. They could buy our books. And how do they find us? Recreative.ca. Don't forget the hyphen. There's a hyphen in there. Re-creative. I took your line. Sorry. Well, because I stole your line. <laughs> so yes, re-creative.ca. Jinx. Oh yeah, you're, that, I stole your line again. <laughs> As well, if you like what you've just heard, you could consider subscribing to the podcast. And leave a comment if you like it. Thanks for listening. Spread the word.